It's my pleasure now to introduce Eric Mitra, who's um, a, a faculty member in the Division of Radiology and with Nuclear Medicine. So he's going to talk to us about diagnostic imaging for kidney cancer. So we had a lot of questions in the morning. Um, please make sure that you direct all of those questions to Eric at the end of his talk about any of the imaging modalities in addition to what he's going to tell us today. Thank you for coming, Eric. I'll put it. Yeah. I'll put it back. Just. Okay, I think we're all set. Well, uh, thank you everyone for being here. My name once again is Eric Mitra. I'm from the Department of Radiology and I specialize in a subspecialty called nuclear medicine. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit broadly about all sorts of uh, different image imaging modalities, but um, because of my bias and also because I think it's kind of the future of imaging, I'm gonna particularly focus on some of the molecular imaging things. Uh, so I just wanted to get a um, uh, raise of hands for how many people are familiar with nuclear medicine. Okay, good good number. And how many people have heard the term molecular imaging? Okay, uh, a little bit fewer. So that's fine. Even in our field, it's kind of a, definitely a novel area. So this is I want to uh, use this to introduce all these topics and then leave some time for questions, as uh, Dr. Srinivas was saying. And I want to thank her also for inviting me to give this talk. So uh, once again, I'll go over some of the more standard modalities just to be complete, but really I'll spend the time, most of the time, focusing on some of the more emerging technologies. So one of the most standard uh, modalities that we have, of course, for uh, imaging is the standard X-ray. It's still a very good workhorse for a lot of different things that we do. And one of the great things about it, actually, is that it has very low amount of radiation and it can quickly image all sorts of areas within the body. The downsides are that it really provides rather limited information. And typically, if you see something abnormal on an X-ray, it means that the uh, size of the abnormality has to be quite large for you to see it. So that means that things have already progressed to quite a degree. Um, and so for that reason, as we're trying to go move towards early cancer detection, the X-ray, which has, again, been around for a long time, isn't really the, the preferred modality. And so nowadays, it, in addition to that, is, is that it will typically require further evaluation with more advanced technologies such as CT scans, MRIs, and uh, ultrasounds. Ultrasound would be the next kind of more basic modality. Uh, here, the primary <laughs> advantage is that it uses no radiation whatsoever. Uh, however, there are several disadvantages to it, is that it, it doesn't have very good depth penetration, and so it's really only good for surface things, although you can look deeper, but the more deeply you look within the body, the less information that you can really evaluate from it. Also, the ultrasound, unlike any of the other modalities that I'm going to be discussing, is very user dependent. So depending on the quality of the technologist who's doing it, it can be a very good ultrasound and you get uh, you know, very interesting information from it, or it could be uh, not very good and, and it's limited information. So now moving on to some of the more advanced technologies, uh, but still ones that probably you're uh, relatively familiar with, so the CT scan or computed tomography, is essentially an X-ray, but that is moves around the body in three dimensions, so providing these three-dimensional views of the body. So the upper image there is of a standard CT scanner. You can see that it's not you know, too closed in, so most patients uh, don't have any issues with claustrophobia related to that. 
And you can uh, begin to see that the image quality that we can get from this, with or without the use of uh, iodinated contrast agent, becomes quite good. Each slice within a CT scan is only one millimeter thick, so you can really slice through uh, the body in very great detail. And typically, we can see things also up to about one millimeter in size. But again, when we're talking about uh, early cancer detection, believe it or not, one milli mil millimeter in size already means something on the order of 10 to 100,000 cells. So that's still quite uh, an advanced um, situation. Was there a, a question? Each um, CT scan that you get can be different from the previous one. So that's a, that's a good question. What's that? Without growth. Yeah, so the question is, can sequential CT scans be different even if the actual body hasn't changed? And yeah, there's always a little bit of difference. So it goes back down to this resolution issue that we're talking about. So if you imagine you know, one um, thing that's stable, and then you slice it one way, and then the next time you slice it slightly differently, you, it might look a little bit different. Uh, it, it could, yeah. But within that s small range. So typically, we ignore things if they're only in that kind of one millimeter, two millimeter change. We, we often say exactly that in our reports that you know, this could be due to technical differences is the jargon that we use. By the way, more and more, that brings up a good point that all our, our, all our um, imaging reports now will become available to you if it's not already available to you. So everything that the referring physician sees, you will also be able to see uh, exactly. The other downsides listed there are it is quite high level amount of radiation depending on the type of CT scan that is done, and also it can be uh, expensive. And if there are any issues with contrast, contrast is something that can cause an allergic reaction or other issues. So those are some things to keep in mind as well, although most patients do just fine with it. Moving on to some of the uh, most advanced technologies is magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, having said that, this has been around now for many decades. The advantage to this is that it essentially combines the advantages of an ultrasound with an advantage of a CT scan. What I mean by that is that there's no radiation involved in an MRI scan. However, it has incredibly a good anatomical detail, just like a CT scan did. However, there are many downsides to it as well that you can see. So it's not the you know, ideal imaging modality for everything. First of all, it's probably the most expensive exam of uh, all the ones that I've listed so far. You can see that the bore uh, of the MRI scanner, unlike the CT scanner, is much uh, smaller and it's longer. So it's essentially like going into this very closed area. And so if there are patients uh, who have issues with claustrophobia, even, and I would even go so far as to say, even if you don't have issues with claustrophobia, <laughs> you know, it can, it can be quite uh, challenging to be in there. And uh, we, when we talk about MR, we talk about sequences, and so you have to acquire a number of different sequences to do a whole scan. Each of those sequences takes time. The radiologist or the technologist sitting out there are just pushing buttons. And it's like, oh, let's do this, and let's do this, and let's do that, but everything is adding up in time. So to get a very complete exam can often be um, you know, at least half hour, if not sometimes even over an hour. If, if you're uh, good, then you might fall asleep in the scanner, and that would be good. But on the other hand, then you might start twitching and cause motion. So, you know, it's far hard to get around it. it. It is kind of loud. And there are restrictions because it's a very strong magnet. So, um, you know, if you have any metal or hardware or other things inside you that cannot be removed prior to the scan, then that would be a contraindication to getting the scan in the first place. So just one example of how this might be worked up. You know, uh, again, an early imaging study would be a x-ray. And what we're looking at here are the two kidneys with contrast in it. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's what we're looking for is basically a normal filling, which is what we see on this side. These are all the, um, the renal calyces. And so this is where the contrast should be coming out. This side looks normal. This side, you can see that there's some in the top part of the kidney, but the entire bottom part of the kidney doesn't have contrast. So you might say, OK, that's something abnormal. And you might follow it up if you're not too concerned with an ultrasound. An ultrasound, again, would be a good first-line study just to evaluate 
kind of generally speaking, what's going on. Perhaps this was just an artifact that you saw on the x-ray and you want to confirm if that's real. And on uh, ultrasound, you can see, you know, again, parts of the kidney that are more cystic and parts that are solid. So then you become concerned that there's something uh, odd going on within one kidney. But really, the answer starts to come when you do the CT scans or MRI scans, both of which are quite good for evaluation of the kidney. And you can see, compared to the right kidney, which looked normal on the x-ray, the left kidney has this very large mass. And that was what was causing you, know, you to see this little bit of activity on the upper part, and then the lower part doesn't have uh, any activity because it's not functioning like normal kidney anymore. OK, any other um, questions about some of those more standard modalities before I move on to some of the more um, newer ones. So, so one of the first newer ones I want to talk about is positron emission tomography. How many people are familiar with that? It's called PET, PET imaging. OK, good. So PET imaging has been used uh, clinically since the uh, early 1990s, and probably most of it has been since 2000. So it really has been around for quite a long time as well. So I'm, I'm glad that many people are aware of it. This looks like the CT scanners and the MRI scanners you saw before, and part of it, it actually is a CT scanner as well. But the PET portion of it, you have to keep in mind, is completely different than anything we looked at before. And the, and the major demarcation that we say there is that all the other modalities were anatomical-based, and this is functional-based. So everything that you see on a PET scan, you're actually looking at cells. And the way we look at those cells is we inject some radioisotope that's attached to a certain molecule, and that molecule then homes in on a certain cellular mechanism. Okay, so it kind of begins to get into what we were talking about in the prior talk in terms of that was at the genomic level. Now we're talking about molecular and cellular level. And so the good thing about that is that the same scanner can be used to investigate all different types of, of cellular physiology within the body depending on which molecule you attach to that radioisotope and then inject. So that makes this very powerful because the same scanner can be bought by the hospital and you can come and get one scan done one day and then the next, very next day you can come back and inject it with a different radioisotope and have a completely different scan essentially because we're looking at now new information. So in terms of um, cons for this, is it, it too is a radiation exam because the radioisotope that we inject into you to evaluate is radioactive to begin with, so that gives you radiation. And then the CT scanner that I mentioned is embedded within this also gives you radiation. It also is uh, relatively ex expensive. And when we talk about kidney cancer in particular, the primary cancer is not well evaluated by this because the main radioisotope that we use is actually cleared through the kidneys, just normal clearance. And so it causes a lot of uptake in the kidneys, and so we can't really evaluate the, the kidneys so well. But for anything outside of it, it works very well. So here's what we, what we actually do, just to give a small detail. We inject you with the um, radioactivity. It circulates around the body. You wait about 60 minutes for it to go everywhere. And then you're actually now the source of the radiation. And the camera, the PET camera, is actually picking up where those molecules have gone to so that we can see what that mechanism is. And it's a type of radioactive decay here that we're following. So here's what those images now look like. This is from a standard FDG scan. FDG is the standard isotope that's been used for the last 20 years or so for PET imaging. But only over the last five years now, we're beginning to see several more radiopharmaceuticals that are now available for PET imaging as well. And each one, again, investigates very different uh, types of physiology within the body. But just to orient you, this is you know, different slices through the body. And this is what we call a um, maximum intensity projection image. But basically, what you're seeing is the distribution, again, of this tracer. Now, the G in FDG stands for glucose. So it's essentially a radioactive form of glucose. And that's literally what we're looking at, is what cells in your body are taking up sugar more than other cells in your body are. And those cells that are cancerous, because they're growing at a faster rate, they tend to take up sugar more than other cells do. And that's exactly how we can see. So these areas that are uh, marked with the arrows represent in this patient some areas of disease. 
And so we know that those areas are abnormal because they're taking up more of the FDG. But I will point out that there are other areas within the body which also show up. This, this for instance, is the right kidney. And so that's what our job is as radiologists, is to know, you know which part of this is normal. This is also a normal organ here called the brain. <laughs> So um, even though you're re resting there, the brain is constantly you know, taking up sugar because it's constantly working, and so it always appears hot. Yes? There are other injuries or inflammation in the body mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So the question was, if there are other areas of injury or inflammation within the body, will those take up glucose? And the answer is absolutely yes. Again, that causes actually one of the main problems for this type of imaging. Is and, and when you read your reports, you know, we sometimes have to equivocate on that and say this could be cancer or this could be, you know, something completely benign. And we hate to do that because it's two ends of the spectrum, but, you know, we can only tell so much. I'm why you would use a PET scan because from what I understand that um, kidney cancer doesn't really light up like other cancers. For instance, if you on, had a chest. On this, on this modality, you mean? Yeah. If you had like a chest lymph node, mm -hmm. it wouldn't light up very much. No, that's actually not true. Um, the, so again, the primary tumor in the, in the kidney, because of the high background clearance from the normal uh, uh, clearance, that you can't evaluate well. But other areas uh, you typically do see. Yeah. It's good for anything other than within the kidney, right? And I'll show you at the next example, actually, it can sometimes even be uh, useful for the kidney area itself. So, you know, it's always helpful when the, uh, what we call the arrow sign is there to help identify the abnormality. But in this case, there's this little bit of uptake uh, here, which you can see much better on the cross-sectional image. And what this is actually is a patient who's had there uh, primary kidney tumor removed. And when that's happened on those other types of imaging, whether it be ultrasound, CT, or MRI, it's very difficult to evaluate that area because there's scar tissue there, there's all sorts of other things from the surgery. If, if, um, if you've had radiation, then that causes changes. So how do you know if some of those things are actual recurrence or is it just post-surgical change? And this, what this is showing you is that there's very high uptake here. And so that represents recurrence, which you would not easily have been able to pick up on a, a non-functional, non-metabolic type of uh, study. <coughs> so to go back to your question about inflammation, this brings up that same point. In you, and one of the reasons why we actually wait after doing surgery is because we know that it's going to be hot immediately after because it's just the inflammatory cells that are taking it up. But if you wait three months, then that should have died down. And if you still see something hot, then you know that that's likely to be a occurrence. And the other area that um, FDG PET, or metabolic imaging as we call it, is very useful is to evaluate response to therapy. And so this is very important to everyone because once you're placed on some type of um, medication, as we were talking about in the, in the prior study, some things work for someone and the same thing might not work for someone else. And then how do you know that? And how do you know that as soon as possible? So that if it's not working, you can switch to something that may work. And so you can see in this <coughs> patient, which is um, an unfortunate person who has you know, very widely metastatic disease, that you can then at baseline see where all the sites of disease are and then nicely follow that after four weeks and after 16 weeks on the therapy and see things coming down. And to even make this point stronger, if you look on the cross-section, because as I mentioned, all our uh, scanners now have PET portion and a CT portion together. We do it together. So here's the CT portion fused to the PET information. And what you can see is that there's this lung nodule here that actually didn't change size even after four weeks on the therapy. But you can see that the metabolic uptake here, the amount of glucose that that is taking, has reduced dramatically. So if you were just doing a CT scan, you might think that that uh, person didn't respond at all, when in fact they did respond very well to the uh, medication. So those are um, some of the ways that are very helpful for this type of uh, modalities. 
So then um, to kind of con conclude, um, I wanted to talk about some of the most emerging technologies, which, ta uh, which uh, you know, goes from everything that I've mentioned before and then takes it to the next level. So I have I've listed a number of different terms here. And I, again, I wanted to see a, a show of hands how many people are familiar with these terms. So have you heard of personalized or precision medicine? OK. OK, yeah. So that's, that's a, a very generic term, but not at all limited to imaging, but to kind of oncology in general, and I would say medicine in general. Uh, Stanford is having a big push about personalized uh, precision medicine, really because it, again, is kind of the future. Molecular medicine ties into that so that, uh, it, yeah, this is a good transition from the prior talk because, again, using all of that kind of genetic molecular data, you can then personalize. So that's what the, the goal of it is. In, in short, is to tailor the therapy to a specific individual rather than just give the same thing to everyone. One of the other things that PET and CT imaging already show you is that everything is kind of moving towards combined modality imaging. So all those different ones that I mentioned, you can think about them in the future as combining them together. So one of the newest types of scanners that actually even Stanford only, we've only had one for one year and many places in the country don't even have one yet, is a PET and MR. So now you can combine those two things together. And there's work going on within the department and in other places where you can combine ultrasound and um, some, of, some other technologies that I haven't even mentioned and put those together to find information. But the whole goal, again, is to really personalize this and make it specific to the um, cancer and specific to the individual. And so one way we can do this specific to PET is as I've been alluding to, is that you can have different radio tracers rather than just FDG to give you new information. And lastly, but not in any way least, is that once you have identified a specific molecular or cellular target that you can image, the beauty of this entire system is that then you can also attach a therapeutic uh, isotope to that same molecule and then actually treat that same tumor type the same thing that you're uh, using to image, you can then treat as well. So this is uh, something that's called theranostics. It's another term I should have thrown in there. And that's a combination of therapy and diagnostics. So uh, it's come together. So this is another great area. So I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. And I don't mean to get into hardcore um, biology here, but just to give you an idea of where some of this might go. So the FDG molecule that I've already talked about <clears throat> over here is actually enters through the glucose pathway. So as I mentioned, it's basically a radioactive glucose. It enters through this specific transporter. And then it's basically showing you this side of the equation within the cell called glycolysis. So that's the sugar being taken up and used for energy. Well, many cancers actually you know, thrive even if you take away the sugar. And so for a long time now, people have considered what other are some of the alternatives. And one of the key things that have uh, come out from that is this molecule called glutamate. It's an amino acid. And your body uses lots of amino acids to help build structures within your body. But this amino acid plays very important roles <clears throat> also in this energy balance within the cell and also on this side of the equation, which is actually showing the reduction of free radicals within the cell. Um, so all of this is very important for the cell maintaining what we call homeostasis and then being able to grow. Now, for a cancer cell, it's the opposite. We want to disrupt their homeostasis and prevent them from growing. But it all comes back to the same biology and understanding it. So where I'm going with this is then if you can then radio label this glutamate molecule just like you radio labeled glucose, then you would be able to begin to see what's going on on this side of the equation for the cells, which gives you very different information. And furthermore, if you can then develop a chemotherapy that blocks the production of the glutamate within the cell, then it would completely stop all of this mechanism and throw off the redox reduction within the cell, all of which could be very beneficial. And this is not science fiction. There is a radioisotope that is now has been made to, that's labeled glutamate. There's even one that labels this one, which is um, called glutamine. It's a precursor to glutamate. And there's a new chemotherapy that's now in phase one trials that actually blocks the conversion of glutamine to glutamate. 
um, and we were actually at Stanford participating in that. So all of this is you know, very relevant to what's going on. The, the key is to then see how well does it work in different cancer types and uh, how well would it work in specific individuals to go back to this idea of personalized medicine. This is just a short list of some of the recent articles that have come out to show you, you know, how much work has been going on into these ideas of glutamate, glutamine imaging, and using this across a different a variety of different types of uh, cancers that you can see listed there. So a couple of examples of what, um, oh, sorry, you had a question? Is the sugar different than the table sugar? It's really the same. It's really the same. Yes, glucose. Well, that gets into a very, uh, very confusing and uh, debatable area, yeah. So as a general statement, it's true that um, glucose is used by cells for growth, but it becomes a very different statement to say that the more sugar I consume, that you're feeding the tumor cells. And actually, this complicated diagram I have here may explain partly why, because it's not just the glucose. The cell has many different pathways for it to grow. So if you reduced the sugar on one side, if you, I mean, if you look, you have to look at these things in a very simplified way, otherwise it just, you know, becomes overwhelming. So if you just look at it as a simple equation that way, even if you reduce the, the sugar on one side, that's exactly what I'm saying, is the cell may just upregulate the glutamate uptake and production and overcome that, you know, potentially. Between what was the relationship between body mass index and uh, metastasis? And it turns out the heavier you are, the longer you live. It turns out so as a result, it wasn't the case that you need to go on and slim down. It seems like the metastasis slows down the more you weigh. So the obvious relationship isn't always in place. You know, it's exactly. good to be it's this good is, to be it's yeah. good to be thin in general so that you don't get this stuff, but once you've got it, exactly what happens is not clear. Yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated area, and it goes to this idea of, you know, is it correlation or causation? What is the true linking? It's very challenging. Okay, so I was just going to show you some images. So this glutamate molecule that we are now beginning to study, just as one example, is called FSPG. We initially did studies, actually, in uh, brain cancer, um, and this was sort of just chosen, I, to be honest, randomly. Uh, but you can see how well nicely these images are. If you actually focus on the right side, you can see the FDG images, the ones you, you've been looking at so far, <clears throat> showing several patients with brain cancer. And um, I know you're not too used to looking at these, but on this patient, you can see it a little bit here. And on these two patients, you actually can't see it at all. This is just normal brain. Remember, I mentioned that the brain always takes up a lot of glucose. And now compare that to these FSPG images. First of all, there's very low background uh, uptake in the brain because it doesn't normally have circulation there. And then you can just see these very small tumors, which are about a millimeter in size, just over a millimeter, really standing out. So it's really dramatic. But even more than the, the dramaticness of the picture, keep in mind that, again, you're looking at very different aspects of the biology. So we're, that's the real point I want to make. So again, you're using the exact same scanner. And these literally, in many patients, were done one day apart from each other. But you're now getting very different information now about what's going on with the glutamate molecule in the cell rather than what's going on with glucose. Um, and we also did some uh, studies with um, head and neck cancer. Sorry, so this was a patient with uh, a nasal cancer, and these were uh, other patients with squamous cell carcinoma. But again, you can see just how much more clearly you can see it on the FSPG scan compared to the FDG scan. This even has potential um, implications for radiation treatment planning, for instance, because you can nicely see the boundaries of the tumor better than it getting obscured by the FDG uptake. And then relevant to this talk, I'm happy to be able to show one image really from a patient actually with kidney cancer. And this was the, so far we've only done one patient um, at Stanford. This is the FDG image from that patient. You can see it's relatively recent. Um, and again, to kind of just orient you that essentially most of what you're seeing on the scan is normal. So there is a normal, lot of normal biodistribution in the brain. 
These are the salivary glands and, and mouth area. The heart always has a, uh, not actually, not always, but often can have very prominent uptake. This is the liver, spleen, bowel, this is kidney. The other kidney was removed. Um, and this is clearance into the bladder from the kidney. So the only sort of little bit of abnormalities are these things here in the chest and, and maybe that one. So now if you compare that to the FSPG image, you can again see a lot of those same, similar normal areas, such as the liver, the kidney. This is actually the pancreas, always lights up heavily on the scan and then the bladder. But then you can see all these other areas you know, that you couldn't see. These are all metastases. Yeah, these are all metastases. And um, even when I went back now seeing the FSPG scan to look on the FDG scan to see if maybe I missed something that was subtle, I still couldn't see it. Here are some cross-sectional images to make this point. So this is the thing in that left chest on FDG. You can barely see it above the background. And here it stands out. We use these SUV values, called standardized uptake values. Um, so for FDG, it was 4. For FSPG, it was 16. Um, here's an example I specifically chose to show that some areas are similar, actually. So on the right side of the chest, this one had an SUV of 5 uh, versus an SUV of 4 with FSPG, so actually a little bit lower. And one more example here in the abdomen. This is a um, uh, nodule in the mesentery. And this has an SUV that I basically couldn't, I couldn't see it. This is one example that I was just mentioning, that even when I went back, I couldn't, I couldn't see any uptake. On CT scan, it does look abnormal, but I wouldn't have picked it up on the FDG. But you know, any person could pick up this nodule right here on FSPG with um, value of 10. Yes? Well, we, we hope. Uh, so the question was, will we be using FSPG more often as we go into the future? What's the criteria for deciding to use it right now? Yeah, so it's a very good question. What is the criteria to, to use it or not? So uh, radiopharmaceuticals are actually mandated by the FDA just like drugs are, although it doesn't really make sense in many ways. That's how they are treated. So we have to essentially go through the same very long, rigorous pathway that, that drugs do in that we have to you know, get initial regulatory approvals just to even do these scans to, to try it and to show that, oh, there is some benefit, as, as there clearly is. And then you have to do more patients and larger studies, larger studies to really document. Then you have to do a, a ton of safety profiling and all of that, and then submit all that to the FDA. And then they will approve it. Even then, there are many tracers who have gone through that enormously long pathways, which can take years, but are still not used, uh, because then, then the next step is that insurance companies have to actually believe in it and approve it uh, for use, because especially new tracers are quite expensive, just because they're not manufactured regularly. So there's a lot of different hurdles, but it all boils down to the biology and proving that it actually does work and work better. The other uh, answer to your question, actually, is that FDG, while it's not good for everything, actually is remarkably well for a lot of different things. So if you use that as your benchmark or your standard to try to overcome, it's quite a high benchmark, yeah. OK, and then in the last uh, minute or so, I just wanted to mention one other thing uh, so that it's not, so, so again, that you get the picture that it, this is not just uh, a small area. It's a really, really booming area and probably new radiopharmaceuticals. Just at Stanford, we have something like 20 or 30 different ones that we're trying now. And across the world, probably over at least over 100. Another common one that's been looked at quite a bit is things that will help evaluate angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the development of blood vessels into um, tumors. So if you, same, same story as glutamate, if you could block that, then that would help prevent the growth of the tumor cells. But equally, if you could image that, then you could know, you know, a, a patient who has high uptake of glutamate would potentially be a good person to put on a therapy that blocks glutamate. A person who has high uptake of an angiogenesis tracer would presumably have good response to an anti-angiogenesis agent. So this is where it ties into this concept of personalized medicine so that we can do a scan on you, identify if you would or would not be a good candidate for something, and then, as I mentioned, follow response at an early time point.
to see, you know, just after a few weeks, is it working or is it not? So these are uh, some examples of, of this tracer. In this case, you have to look a little bit harder in comparison to FDG. But again, you can see that you, you can see certain things on, on this tracer called FPPRGD2 for angiogenesis that you can't see on the comparative FDG image. Here's perhaps an even more clear example, again, from brain cancer of a patient who has, does have some abnormality on the FDG scan. I wouldn't have called this negative, but it's much, much easier to see on the angiogenesis uh, tracer. But even perhaps more important than that is that this is <coughs> um, that patient showing before the chemotherapy with an anti-angiogenesis agent called Avastin versus after. And if, again, if you look at these SUV values, they've actually gone down. And other patients that we've scanned using the same protocol have not gone down after uh, using Avastin for the same amount of time. And so what we're finding is that those patients who have a reduction of the angiogenesis with the agent, as you would, as you would kind of normally think through, that means that that's working. And that's why you have a reduction in angiogenesis. And so they, in fact, in the outcome studies are doing better. And other patients who didn't respond in this way they didn't do as well. So that's kind of a big overview of a lot of different imaging modalities and, and, and novel techniques. There's going to be a lot more to come from, from this area, and it's really, again, going to tie into this concept of personalized medicine, which is, I think, great for everyone. So thank you very much.